I'm not a, a foe of video games because games are complicated and it isn't clear what people are doing when they're playing them you know, they may be expanding their cognitive skills they may be learning to cooperate, they may be learning to engage in complex problem solving and so, but part of it's also a matter of balance you know, 50 hours a week, probably not unless you're going to go pro, right? because there's other things you need to be attending to, it's not a stable solution for you, your family, your society it's too one-sided, yeah, and you can get pulled down rabbit holes of all sorts that, that are one-sided pursuits of meaning so, and it's something we're actually going to talk about as the later classes unfold the question is, how do you stop yourself from falling prey to a pathologized sense of meaning? and I think one of the answers to that is, don't lie because what you're hoping is that your nervous system is sufficiently healthy and well programmed so that what it reads out to you is reliable and if you pathologize your psyche by either through sins of omission, let's say, or, or outright deception you're going to warp that internal structure and it's not going to read out properly to you and then your sense of meaning will lead you astray so like one of the reasons for speaking the truth I shouldn't say that, because you don't know how to speak the truth but you do know how not to lie and it, it's a game you're playing with yourself you can define the damn lies, no one else has to do that for you you, you, you try not to utter falsehoods because you warp your neurological structure by doing so and then it will read out pathologically and then if you rely on it to guide you, it will run you right off a cliff so that's why there's a moral element to this is if you're going to rely on your sense of meaning make sure that you don't pollute the mechanism see, this is, this is partly why people go to confession right, which is, my, which is a, like I said, a psychotherapeutic technique it's like, okay, what stupid, miserable, wretched things did I do this week? Well, that's a good thing to, to make conscious, right? because maybe you cannot do them the next week and you think, well, why would you bother? it's like, well, you're in a ship it's sailing across the, the, the stormy seas if, if, you're, if you're hacking holes in it with a pickaxe, you should probably pay attention to that before you sink so, it's a good idea to keep, to keep what you're doing that's stupid in mind, so that you can stop doing it and so then you can more and more rely on yourself and your, and your own, you know, your own conscience, let's say, as a guide to proper action you know in the Pinocchio story is that the conscience was not an unerring guide for Pinocchio it had to learn and so, and so, it's also partly pushing yourself into new situations and differentiating yourself so that you get wiser and, and so it's courage as well as truth those, those might be the two there's more, beauty, courage, truth, you know, the fundamental virtues yeah. why be virtuous? that's the question it's so that you can bear the suffering of life without becoming corrupt right it's practical it's practical, it, there's nothing more practical than that so, unless you want misery and people do, you know it's exciting, misery you could say that the ultimate sense of meaning is composed of the union of fragmentary senses of meaning and the fragmentary senses of meaning can be overwhelmingly powerful anger, sexual lust and, and, and the sorts of things that you experience, when, say, when you're playing a video game which are very carefully calibrated to keep you on the, on the edge of exploration, let's say the kids who could delay gratification at an early stage were doing quite a bit better later in life now, I don't know to what degree that was controlled for IQ, because such things matter but the point is, is that, well, the point is the point that you're making is that you can delay, you can only delay gratification intelligently though if the social structure is stable Right? Because basically, what, if you delay gratification, you're making a bargain with the potential future. And the bargain is everybody's going to keep acting the same way so that the future is the same as the present. Because otherwise, you'll delay gratification and then everything will fall apart and you won't get your cake and you won't get to eat it. And so, society has to be quite stable. It has to be stabilized by the contractual relationship between people before delaying gratification is a useful strategy. This is also why you see. Um, in chaotic circumstances where the future becomes uncertain people forego delay of gratification very very rapidly and, and, and perhaps appropriately so what happens as you stabilize societies being conscientious, conscientious becomes more useful 
And so then you're going to be selected for as a consequence of being conscientious and that's going to stabilize the society even more. These are, these are roughly known as Baldwin effects. So that's where, let's call it a genetic transformation, produces a behavioral transformation that transforms the environment so the genetic transformation is more likely to propagate. You can get unbelievably rapid evolutionary movements when, when you get a loop like that developing. And, and they, they happen frequently. And that's, that's also how, in some sense, a meme can be turned into a genetic, can manifest itself genetically. So if you have an idea that spreads through the culture, and it tilts the culture in a certain way, such that those who hold that idea are likely to be more successful, then the meme and the biology will align themselves across time. And, and well, I think you see that happening. That's that, to some degree, that's what's happened as religious stories have propagated themselves as well. Because as, as the idea of the hero becomes clearer, so to speak, and then it manifests itself more clearly in the society, then there's more rewards for doing it, then the selection pressures get more positively related to that kind of behavior, and the whole thing loops upwards. So, it's something like that. Um, in terms of treating mental health disorders, where do you think we should draw the line, or how should we draw the line between uh, pharmaceutical interventions and uh, various other psychotherapy methods. I mean, to what, at what point is depression and anxiety should be treated with medicine, and at what point should it be, is it a... Uh okay, that's a good question. Medical interventions, anything. If you're sick, you do what it's necessary to get better, and you leave your pride behind if you, if you have to. And uh, that, that says nothing about the utility of the behavioral interventions. You want to hit the problem with everything you have at your disposal. But some antidepressants, especially, especially for people whose lives are together and who are depressed, antidepressants can be absolutely miraculous. So, you know, when you hear about the clinical evidence in their favor being iffy, and that's partly because the diagnosis of depression isn't very well formulated. There's, it's very different to have a terrible life than to be depressed. And antidepressants can only help you so much if you have a terrible life. How do you differentiate the utility of behavioral slash psychotherapeutic treatments for conditions like depression versus medical treatments? Okay, so the first thing I would say is um, don't underestimate the utility of medical interventions. Depression is a cat catastrophe. It carries with it a very high suicide rate. And it also levels people out, and it's really hard on their families. And, so, and, it, and it's physiologically extraordinarily damaging. And so, if you're in a depressive state, and it's severe, you can try an antidepressant. You'll know in a month if it works. If it works, well, maybe it'll help you get your life together. Like, we could say, well, maybe you're depressed because your life isn't very well together. Could be. Sometimes people are depressed, their life is just... It isn't fine, because no one's life is fine. Everyone's life is a tragedy. But sometimes people have their lives in order as much as you could expect anyone to have. They have friends, they have an intimate relationship, they have a career that they like. You know, they're, they're qualified, industrious people, working hard on what they're doing, and, and, and really playing a minimum number of games with themselves. And they're terribly depressed. Antidepressant, man, that's, sometimes that will just fix it. And so, hooray, like, you're a biological entity. If, if there's something out there that can help you strengthen yourself so that you can prevail, great. And, you know, people, you hear, everyone takes antidepressants, you know, everyone's taking them. It's like, no one takes those bloody things without serious consideration. Half the time I spend with my clients who are depressed is often the two years long attempt to get them to tentatively try an antidepressant. Because they're so guilty that they're relying on an external crutch to sort out their lives that they can't even tolerate it. But, you know, I say, well, look, man, what if you had diabetes? You're not going to take your insulin? It's like, you got stressed, you blew out at your weakest point. That's what happens when you get stressed. If there's something out there that might help you, it's like, try it, for God's sake. You'll know in a month, and, and you just stop if it doesn't work. Now, having said that, you want to do a multidimensional analysis. It's like, well, do you have any friends? 
do you have an intimate relationship or are you pursuing one? Do you have a reasonable career? Are you as educated as you are intelligent? Do you have something useful to do with your time outside of work? Do you have a drug or alcohol problem? Are there other behavioral issues like sleep dysregulation and lack of eating that are contributing to the pathology? You want to differentiate all of that and wherever you can make a behavioral intervention, so much the better. But sometimes too, you're dealing with people whose lives are so wrecked that they don't even know where to start. 